Well, it's good to see you today. Uh, we begin a brand new series in the book of Revelation, and so we're in Revelation chapter 1. I hope you got the newsletter this week. You remembered to bring your Bibles, something to write with, and everybody you know. Some people did not bring everybody they, they know, clearly. Uh, you tried. It's all right. Hey, praise the Lord. We're glad for everyone who is here and everyone who is joining us online. And so, uh, hopefully you grabbed uh, something to write with if you didn't bring something. So, Jenny and uh, maybe Steve and Ronnie out there, we're giving you some pencils if you need them. There's also the study guide. So, if you need that, you can grab that out there. We'll be cruising through that. Uh, but we'll be in Revelation chapter 1, and I'm excited about uh, this journey in the book of Revelation. So let's pray one more time uh, as we begin. Father in heaven, thank you so much that this is my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. So thank you so much, Lord. Would you teach us again through your word? Lord, we're praying for an outpouring of your spirit to give us understanding, to speak to us wherever we may be found, Lord, that your word would get to us, would draw us close, would give us perspective, and give us clear direction to go with you. Thank you so much. Let everyone say amen and amen. How many of you have ever been anointed? Anybody? A couple, three, three over here. All right. Very good. Um, I've been a part of a number of anointings. This week, I got to be part of an anointing. I guess it was on Thursday at 4 o'clock. Went to a home, and we were anointing uh, a friend of mine. She's uh, my parents' age. She had worked at Blue Mountain Academy uh, as the recruiter and communications 30-plus uh, years ago. And so I knew her there and her sons, and then she moved to Central California, was the vice president for communications for the conference there, and now she lives here. But actually, when she retired from uh, working at the conference in Central Cal, she moved back to Pennsylvania for a while, and while, uh, when she moved back, she actually joined uh, one of the churches I was pastoring, and so got to see her all the time. Well, uh, got the invitation from Pastor Jamie Houghton, uh, of the McDonald Road Church to join the anointing. So I was part of that on Thursday, and Karen was asking to be anointed for a physical challenge that she's experiencing. And so we gathered together, and then she reminded me of something, and she said, actually, uh, Chris, you've anointed me before. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. And I was like, well, you did? I had to think about it for a second. We were having a small group at our house uh, every single week, and so people were coming to our house when we lived in Pennsylvania, and she was one. She would come with her granddaughter, Kylie, and so they would be there. And one night, uh, she was <clears throat> sharing a physical thing that was going on in her life, and so we anointed her. And as I'm prone to do, I'd f forgotten that fact, but not only did I forget that we anointed her, I forgot that God healed her of that. So she said, you, you've been part of anointing before. You anointed me for this. You, you and the group, you prayed. And God healed me. I was like, oh, yes, yes. I need to start writing these things down. Yes, this is amazing. It's awesome. So we gathered around her and we, we prayed. And if you're not familiar with this, this is in response to James chapter 5. If anyone is sick among you, call for the church elders uh, and pray, anoint with oil and pray in the name of Jesus. And the prayer of faith will... Save the sick. That's the promise. So we're gathering in obedience in response to what God's Word says. And uh, there we are. So we uh, all prayed, and Pastor Jamie anointed her, and we were, we were done. Uh, the people's house who were hosting at the point, they said, you know, we have some refreshments. And okay, so we went over there, and there's some fruit salad and some different things. So we're just kind of eating. And um, I, I began to talk to an, uh, Karen's best friend, Ellen. And Ellen is there and, and talking, and I said, you know, I just, I believe in anointing. I said, you know, my, uh, my, my dad was anointed, he had leukemia, and God healed him. And she's like, oh, wow, praise the Lord. She said, my husband had leukemia. He was anointed, and he died. Oh. She said, but you need to know, here's the story. We were at the hospital, and the pastor and the elders came, surrounded my husband there. And this is just a few years ago, surrounded him, and he's in the hospital with leukemia, about to anoint him. They're in the process of praying, and all of a sudden, he told everyone to stop. And he said, you've got to bring Ellen, his wife. You've got to bring her into the center of the circle now, because she needs to be anointed too for strength to go forward 
after this moment. Okay, so they brought her in. They anointed him. They anointed her, both with oil. They prayed for both. And as I already, you know, spoiled the story, he passed away. I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. She said, well, that's not the end of the story. Have you ever noticed with Jesus, it's oftentimes not the end of the story? That all of a sudden, right when you think that the story has ended, there's, there's this moment. And oftentimes, it's not now. It's a little bit later. It's delayed. But all of a sudden, when you think it's over, all of a sudden, there's this revealing of Jesus. You say, well, you were up to something the whole time. She says, my husband passed away. She said, but what was so amazing, she said, I was healed. I said, you were healed of what? She said, I had a congenial, congenial? Congenital, yes, that too. She had a congenial, <laughs> very, con <laughs> yes, congenial, very <laughs> congenital, congenital, from birth is what it means. Had a, had a physical problem from birth, often suffering with this, and God healed her, never experienced it again. And I was like, this is an amazing story. Just when you thought that Jesus was nowhere to be found, he shows up to give you encouragement that when it doesn't look like it, he's still working. There is this revealing of him being present when it doesn't seem like he is. Today we are in Revelation chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, I hope you do because we've got no PowerPoint. Somebody say amen. All right. Revelation chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. And it says this, the revelation of who? The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God, which God gave him to show his servants the things which must shortly what? Take place. It begins this book. The revelation of Jesus. This book is about the revealing, pulling back the curtain, exposing in the midst of a lie by the enemy of who God is, who Jesus is. Remember, the enemy has put out this narrative that God is this exacting creditor looking for the opportunity to zap kill and destroy, but in fact, that is his character. This is the opportunity God takes in the Word to reveal truly who Jesus is. I love what it says in this book called Ministry of Healing. It says what the world needs today is what it needed 2,000 years ago. A, fill in the blank on your study guide, a revelation of Jesus. It's one thing for us to have all the information about Jesus, but what the world needs today, more than us just giving them information, they need to see lives that have been transformed by the power of the gospel. Because that's more powerful than anything I can say to people. When people say, man, that person is so different. Say, You're so, I'm telling you, <laughs> let's be clear up front. It's not me. It's Jesus. How did you get past this or that? Let me be clear. I was not strong enough. I was stuck. But Jesus. He did it. When people see lives that are changed, all of a sudden the Spirit of God works in their heart to stir up, to ignite, to kind of fan the flame of faith. Wait a second. If he did it for her, if he did it for him, maybe, just maybe, me too. What the world needs today is what it needed 2,000 years ago is the revelation of Jesus. This is especially important because, verse 3, the time is, the time is near, fill in the blank. Do you believe that? I believe that Jesus is coming soon. There is actually not much time. What, that doesn't mean the sky is falling, we should panic, and let's run to the hills and isolate ourselves. What it means is we need to be intentional, we need to be sober in regards to the time we live in, Jesus is coming. There is no putting off, there is no delay, there is no procrastination. Today is the day of salvation for me and you. And so we take seriously this following of Jesus, starting our day on our knees. Before we take a step into our day, we start on our knees and say, Lord, you are, prayer warrior, those who studied with us on Wednesday nights, you are the general. What are my marching orders today? Because wherever I go, I need you to lead. This is especially important because the time, still fill in the blank if you missed it, is near. 
As we go forward, John shares this message. We look at verses 4 and 5. Look at verses 4 and 5. John shares a message from heaven in verse 4. Begins his grace to you and what? Peace. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and is to come. I would suggest to you that this one, this him, was, is, is to come, is God the Father. And grace and peace from, going forward, from the seven spirits who are where? Before his throne. I would suggest to you that this is God the Holy Spirit. Going forward, it's grace and peace from him. Who? From Jesus Christ there at the beginning of verse 5. I would suggest, obviously, this is the most obvious one. This is Jesus, God the Son. As we look at this, look at your study guides. This is another, another biblical example of the Trinity. This is another biblical example of the Trinity. As this biblical doctrine comes under fire and question today, the Bible is very clear that God is three in one. Can you explain that more? And the answer is no. If we could explain God, he certainly would not be God. Verse 5. Jesus has, is included in this greeting of grace and peace. And in verse 5 it says, Jesus, the faithful Witness. He is the faithful witness. You, you, you may realize this, that Jesus came and he says, if you have seen me, you've seen right. He is witnessing to the character of who God is. Remember, the enemy has put out a narrative to who God is, but Jesus comes and doesn't just talk about it. He makes all these words that were spoken in the Old Testament come alive in a real life, day to day, walking, touching people, changing their lives, talking with them, listening to them, smiling with them. I mean, all this stuff. The words become flesh. He is the faithful witness to the true character of God. The faithful witness. I love what Prescott says. It's on your study guide there. Christ lived his life here in the flesh to show us what the image of God is. But he is not, fill in the blank, satisfied with that. He wants us to cooperate with him and letting that life be lived again in us. He's not satisfied with just saying, look, this is what God is like. He wants that life, that image to be put back in us. Remember, Adam, Eve, they're created in the image of God, right? I've said it before, you know, little, little Cain, um, little Abel sitting with mom Eve and saying, man, man, you walked with the creator at the, in the cool of the day. What did he look like? Oh, boys, I'm telling you, your dad looked just like him. But all of a sudden, right, the law is broken. Sin enters and their character, the image of God is broken. They, they can't naturally, in and of themselves, follow. They don't have the strength. There has to be something that makes a difference. And so Jesus shows up and says, this is what God is like. But here's the thing. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. I'm going to stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and makes the exercises of the power I've created with to open up that door, that's all you got to do. And I will come in. And I will eat with them. But I bring nothing to the table. Jesus says, I've already set the table. Just make a decision for me to come in, and I will do this work in you. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. He takes out the heart of stone, puts in a brand new heart of flesh. On that heart of flesh is written the very character of God. There is this restoration, this rebuilding, this image restoration that is put back in us, this thing called the gospel. Righteousness imparted, imputed by faith, right? He's the faithful witness. He's not satisfied with just showing you what it's like. He wants to rebuild that image in us again. He is the faithful witness called in verse 5. Also in verse 5, he's called the firstborn from the dead. Now let's be clear. If somebody is the firstborn, it's kind of, uh, you're, you're making an insinuation that there must be a secondborn or maybe a thirdborn and on and on and on. But you remember in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only. Jesus in the Godhead, I, again, I don't know exactly how all this works, but he takes on the role of a son. And he's described as the only son. This is the only son of the Father. That's it. 
But then he goes to the cross, gives away his life, he rises from the dead, and all of a sudden the Bible begins to speak differently after that. Not the only begotten anymore. Now it's the firstborn. If you have your Bibles there, turn with me to Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Romans 8, verse 29, it says this. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That's us. Not satisfied with just showing us the image. He wants us to be conformed to that image. Going on, that he... Jesus might be the firstborn among many brethren. Are we getting this picture here that fill in the blank on your study guide, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus created the fill in the blank path for us to be children of God. Before the cross, before the resurrection, there is this gulf that we cannot cross. We are separated from God our Father because of, this, because of sin. We can't get over there. There's no way. Jesus is the only begotten. He gives his life. He lays it down. Can you see a cross following across that gully, across that valley? All of a sudden, Jesus creates a path for us also to be called children of God. What does John say in 1 John Behold, what manner of love is this that we would be called children of God? That you and I get to be children too because of what Jesus has done. Jesus has created a path for us to become children of God. So in verse 5, to him who loved us, to him who washed us from our sins in his own blood, and to him who has, thank you, to him who has made us. You catch all those things? What does the Lord do? What does Jesus do? He loves us. Before you take a step in the right direction, before you do a good thing, before all the... He, he just is in love with all of us. Think about the creator God who just can't get you off his mind. It is that thought of you that dro- propels him to a cross. Angels are... Why are you... Because he's thinking about you. Please take that personal. He loves us. And because he loves us, he washes us from our sins in his own blood. He gives away his life. And then he is the one who made us, makes us, remakes us, righteous by faith. Did you get the picture there? The fill in the blank here. The work of redemption is, fill in the blank, completely accomplished through Jesus. We cannot think that we do anything that adds to our salvation. It is not righteous by faith plus works. It is righteous by faith. Somebody say period. Righteous by faith in what Jesus has done. The work of redemption is completely accomplished through Jesus. Verse 7. Behold, he is coming. Somebody say amen. Jesus is coming. Behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him. Imagine how this is going to work. Southern hemisphere, northern hemisphere, east and west. And the Bible is clear that this will not be a a private event. That's why we fill in the blank here. Jesus' coming will not be a secret. It will be a public event. The Bible says that every eye will see him. Still in verse 7, behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him. Even they who pierced him. Does that raise some questions? Because that takes us to Calvary, doesn't it? It takes us to Calvary and those who pierce him. We think of uh, of Roman soldiers and we think of uh, uh, civil leaders who made the decisions and the decrees that he would be crucified. We, We think of religious leaders and and people uh, there in Israel who had positions, who were, who were fighting, and they were leading the chance of crucify him, crucify him. We think of a soldier who had a spear, and we think of the soldier who pounded the nails. We think of all these different individuals, and of course, they're dead, right? They're not still alive. This was 2,000 years ago. Jesus is coming in clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. We have insight found in Daniel chapter 12, beginning in, verses, beginning in verse 1, going to verse 2. So if you want to look there quick, Daniel chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. I hear one Bible turning. At that time, 
Michael. Who is Michael? Michael, the, the Hebrew word there is the one who is like God. This is another name for Jesus. At that time, Jesus, Michael, the one who is like God, shall stand up. Who is this one? Ah, it's the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of, what does your Bible say? A time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. Context is this. Matthew 24, Jesus shares that. It makes it very clear that right before he comes back, there is going to be a time of trouble. God's people will be persecuted for their faith and their commitment and their relationship to Jesus. There will be a most difficult time. Uh, this will be an unprecedented time is the way the Bible describes it. But we need not fear. We near not, need not all of a sudden say, well, I need to go to Sam's. I need to go to, uh, where's Jenny? Where do you work? I need to go to Costco and buy eight months of food and all this kind of stuff. What does the Bible say? The great prince is the one who stands watch over his people. God's going to supply right? The one who began a good work in you is going to complete it. He's not going to leave you hanging and say, well, I huh, hope you make it. No. He stands watch over his people. He will take care of he, his people. Will some people be put in jail? Will some people be persecuted? Will some people be arrested? Will some people be, even be killed? The answer is yes. But there's just something that we find in Scripture. We find these apostles and we find these early Christians. When, when the enemy brought the worst against them, it's as if that stirred up their greatest joy. I'm still confused. The worst things got, they were beaten with rods, they were put in the dungeon, they were, I mean, all this kind of stuff, and they rejoiced that they had the privilege of suffering for the name of Jesus. Oh, that is the work of righteousness by faith. Lord, you need to do that work in me, that I would rejoice, not because I found an extra $20 in my pocket, but I would rejoice because the enemy has brought something that is bringing further glory to you and taking the gospel further. This unprecedented time. So we know the context when Michael or Jesus stands up is right before his second coming. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book, that is the Lamb's book of life, verse 2, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Amen? This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. For the Lord himself, same Jesus, will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. Could it be that the trumpet of God is actually just the voice of Jesus? And the dead in Christ, when they hear the voice of Jesus... Just like Lazarus. Lazarus, come forth. He calls them by name. I believe he hear, every person hears their name called by Jesus. Sally, John, Melissa, Juan, I mean, whoever it is, we're going home. We'll wake to everlasting life. But wait a second. And then some to shame and everlasting contempt. The Bible describes here that fill in the blank, there will be a special resurrection of those who participated in the crucifixion. There will be a special resurrection. Here's some insight from a book called The Great Controver Controversy, page 643. It says this, there are those who mocked Christ in his humiliation. Those who derided his claim to be the Son of God are now speechless. There is the haughty Herod who jeered at his royal title and bade the mocking soldiers crown him king. There are the very men who with the impious hands placed upon his form the purple robe, upon his sacred brow the thorny crown, and in uh, his hand the mimic scepter, and bowed before him in blasphemous mockery. The men who spit on the prince of life now turn to flee from the overpowering glory of his presence. Those who drove the nails pierced his side. Behold the marks with terror and remorse. With awful distinctness do priests and ru rulers recall the events of Calvary. Terror and remorse. You say, wait, 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 they're, they're ready to repent. No, I believe that at this point it's very clear through Scripture that if even more time was given, 
they would not truly repent. Well, no, there's remorse there. They remorse the consequences of sin. They do not remorse sin, the path of sin. If more time was given, they would push aside the hand of Christ. They would push it aside again and again because undoubtedly the one who loves them too has come after them tenaciously. The question, one of the questions this afternoon, this evening, and are you online, let me ask you, what are you doing with that outstretched hand of Christ? Are you receiving that hand or are you pushing it away? Are you waiting for a later moment that's uh, more convenient for you or a moment where you think you're a better person and you're more qualified? Friend, the moment you hear the Spirit of the living God calling you is the moment to take His hand. Because, as we talked about the 10-second rule and all this kind of stuff, that uh, procrastination is not your friend. The enemy will use it to all of a sudden you'll be distracted with this and that and the other thing and you'll be on to the next thing. And that voice will be drowned out by all the things that we allow to come into our lives. Still in verse 7, it says this, and all the tribes, tribes fill in the blank, and all the tribes of the earth will will mourn. This is interesting. All the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, because of Jesus. That word tribe made me think of the first angel's message found in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, where it talks about the nations, tribes, tongues, and people. I, I, you've heard me say this before. I believe that that's a description of the separation caused by sin. The separation caused by sin, like the Tower of Babel, caused people to go into this nation, into that tribe, into this language. I mean, just there's all this separation. In that context of separation, the everlasting gospel is preached. Tribe is an allusion to the separation caused by sin, as described in Revelation 14, 6. But the work of the everlasting gospel is the cross-powered, decision-permitting transfer from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. From the kingdom of the enemy into the kingdom of God. So there's a description that they're mourning because they've, re- they've resisted the hand, the grace-filled hand of Christ, and they've remained in this separated state from God. And they mourn because of it, because they see, oh, here are the, the results of sin in this moment. But the preaching of the everlasting gospel, and, and actually, do you remember there in Matthew chapter 4, it says, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of God is here. Jesus came for the purpose of calling people out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Notice this in Colossians 1.13. Colossians 1.13. It says this, He has delivered us from the power of darkness. He has delivered us from the power of of the dark realm, the dark kingdom. And the the Greek word that is translated is conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed. That Greek word means to transfer or to move from one place to another. They mourn because they have not accepted the grace of God that would have moved them from one place to another. Please understand, there is none righteous, no, not one. We're all in the same boat, and we are all stuck. But the good news of the everlasting gospel is that Jesus is so strong because of his victory on Calvary. He can transfer us from where we're at to another place. He can take us out of the the devil's book of death and put us into the Lamb's book of life, out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God. They mourn because they have not, when they heard the voice of Jesus saying, I'm at the door, they did not open it. They refused to open it. And they mourn, fill in the blank, they mourn because they have willfully, willfully rejected the gospel. Oh, friend, tonight, I do not believe. We, we've been praying. We pray on Wednesday nights. We've been praying by night. Maybe you watch. We've been praying for you. We've been praying that God would bring people. God would speak to people through the Holy Spirit. And you being here, you watching now or later, is, is I believe, evidence that the Spirit of God is calling you, putting out His hand and saying, would you accept the transfer? The difference here is, it says, they mourn because they have willfully rejected the gospel. Man, I wonder tonight if anybody could celebrate because they have willfully accepted the gospel. 
Not because, again, because, okay, I'm strong enough this time. All right, I'm really going to do it. Friend, you got to give up. You got to give up and say, I can't do it, but Christ can do it in me. Why? Because I feel it? No, because he said it. Jesus said it, and what he said he will do. I can't, but I just believe if he did it for all these people in this book, it's not here so we can say, oh, that was a nice story. No, it's here to kindle the, the, the little spark of faith. Wait a second. He did it for her. He did it for him. If he did it, you know what? Then do it in me, Jesus. Do something in me. He wants to do something in you, that there will be joy in your home tonight. There will be joy in this place tonight because you have willfully intentionally accepted the gospel. Verse 8, Jesus, again, this revealing of Jesus, I am the Alpha and the Omega. If you've taken Greek, Jason and I uh, just loved it. We were just, we, we tried, we took Greek together, 8 a.m., Jason was oftentimes awake, 7 a.m., he was sometimes awake. And so we're in Greek, and Alpha, first letter in the Greek alphabet. Omega, last letter in the Greek alphabet. It's like saying I'm the A and the Z. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, Jesus says, the beginning and the end. This book right here, the book of Revelation, is a revealing of Jesus. So Jesus says, I'm the beginning and the end. Verse 9, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation. It doesn't matter if you're living in 2024 or 2,000 years ago. Life is hard. There's going to be challenges. He says, I get it. There's hard times. I'm your companion also in the kingdom because guess what? Just like you, I've accepted the hand of grace and I have had a transfer that was put in for me and I moved from one kingdom to another. And patience of Jesus Christ. That takes me to the third angel's met. Here is the patience of the saints. This guy has experienced righteousness by faith. Because remember, he was John, the son of thunder. I'm bull in a china shop, like just what? getting mad at stuff. And, you know, I mean, all kinds of stuff, right? And then all of a sudden, he becomes the best friend of Jesus. And he's called John the Beloved. That relationship results in, he goes from John, uh, the son of thunder, to John, the revelator. John, the revealer of Jesus. Friends, what this world needs today is what it needed 2,000 years ago. It needs a whole army of revealers of Jesus. And not that we say, all right, I'm going to be just like him. Again, it's not us. It's the work of God through us. He does a work in us, and he begins new heart, and he shines out of us like the face of Moses after he spent those days on that mountain with him. He has a testimony to give to the power of the gospel. He was on the island called Patmos for the word of God. God allowed him to go there. So the word of God would go further, and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Whenever the Bible talks about the Lord's day, it is talking about the seventh day Sabbath. And I heard behind me a loud voice as of a, as of a trumpet. That's why we threw out that First Thessalonians little thing. Maybe it's his voice. As of a trumpet saying, wait a second, for the second time, I am... The Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. He, he reiterates that. He's now said it twice in this chapter. And what you see, John, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. Verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke uh, with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like what? The Son of Man. He sees Jesus. Later in this chapter, we, we get the very clear uh, definition that the lampstands represent the seven churches. So where is Jesus standing? In the middle of the church. Don't raise your hand. How many of you have ever become frustrated with this thing called church? You ever been hurt by this thing called church? You ever want to give up on church? You ever get mad at people at church? The answer is probably yes for most of us in different scenarios. But please understand that Jesus is the one who created Ecclesia, this thing called church. He created it. He is the head of it. No doubt there's going to, was G, did Jesus have challenges with the church when he was here? It was the church, I mean it was a different setup, but it was the religious who killed him. But Jesus brings together Ecclesia, the called out ones. 
and brings them together. He is the head. There's going to be frustrations. The enemy would have us give up and walk away. But Jesus says, no, no, stop looking at people. Stop looking uh, um, horizontally and look vertically to the head. Pray for those in leadership. Pray for those around us and keep going on because you have a spot in this body and she has a spot in this body and he has a spot in this body and I've gifted you. And when you all work together, guess where the gospel goes? It goes further. So maybe, just maybe, he's calling us in the midst of the challenges from those who were supposed to be on the same team to stay united and go forward, keeping our eyes on the head because Jesus is in the middle of his church. The Son of Man that he sees his clothes with a garment down to his feet, girded about the chest with a gold band. His head and hair were white as wool, as white as snow. His eyes like a flame of fire. His feet like fine brass as refined in a furnace. And his voice is the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun, somebody get me some eclipse glasses, shining in its strength. Verse 17, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. What this world needs is what it needed 2,000 years ago, a revelation of Jesus that it would sweep us all off our feet that we'd find ourselves at the feet of Christ, saying, you're the head, wherever you want to go, me too. We just finished with Ruth. What did she say? Where you go, I will go. Where you live, I will live. Where you die, I will die. All that same stuff. When we get a clear picture of Jesus, man, oh man, I believe it sweeps us off our feet. We find ourselves at his feet and we say, Whatever, where, wherever you're trying to take me, I want to go. But I acknowledge you're going to have to carry me. Because I'm too weak. I love this little, how this, how this plays out. But he laid his right hand on me saying to me, John, it's me. Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. This is the third time, mind you. Verse 18. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Revelation chapter 1 is a very interesting chapter because here, fill in the blank, in Revelation 1, we find, we find the state of the dead. We find the second coming. We find the Sabbath. We find the Trinity. We find the gospel and righteousness by faith. I mean, what about a chapter you can just dig deep into that can edify our growing faith and direction from Christ? But it is in this chapter, verse 8, verse 11, verse 17, Three times Jesus says, I am the Alpha, the Omega. I'm the first and the last. I'm the beginning and the end. It's one thing if he said it, it's revealing, to, oh, you, you're that. Okay, yeah, I get it. But then he says it again. And then he says it again. Jesus declares that he is the beginning of all beginnings, and he is the one who alone determines the end. Amen. Question. If he's the beginning and the end, how do I, how do we make him everything in between? Because it's one thing to say, oh, man, I get it. I see biblical truth, and okay, wonderful, fantastic. I'm going to be baptized, and I'm going to join the church, and, and now I'm just going to hold out. I'm going to wait it out until you come back, and oh, you're back, okay. He's the beginning and the end. How do I make him my all and all? How do I make him the head? How do I make him Lord? How, in every step in between. Three suggestions here on your study guide. Number one, pray alone. You say, well, I thought you would have talked about the Bible. I thought you would have talked about serving people. I Certainly within prayer, as you pray alone, you're getting out your Bible and you're praying uh, back what God has said. You're, you're claiming His promises, whether it's forgiveness or His presence in your life or, or whatever it is. But pray alone. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High will dwell in the shadow of of the Almighty. If you're in somebody's shadow, man, you're, you're sticking close. That's what happened with John. Pray alone. Set sp sp uh, specific, there's the word, specific times with parameters. Set a time that, that other stuff just can't get in the way. Pray alone. Secondly, pray as a family. Rebuild the family altar. 
Rebuild the family altar and pray as a family. Number three, pray in groups. Pray in groups. You say, well, again, okay, so you're going to pray. Oh, you, you include the Bible. Okay, but what about, so I believe that as you pray alone, you, you just can't stay there. Those who just pray and that's all you do, soon you'll find yourself not praying anymore. But when you pray and you spend that time with Jesus, all of a sudden you begin to learn his voice more. And all of a sudden he's going to start to uh, lead you in a direction. And if you respond to that, you're going to find yourself doing the works of Jesus as he lives in you and then works through you. So pray, pray alone, pray as a family, and then pray in groups. Man, can we try it? Can we try it? All of this stuff. The time is near, shortly to take place. Can we try it? The vision has been 120 people on Wednesday night for prayer meeting. We start with prayer. We, we just studied it for 13 weeks on it. But we start with prayer because that's where Jesus sent his, his early disciples there after uh, his uh, resurrection and ascension uh, into heaven. He sent them and said, go wait. Go back to that room, and I want you to pray. Watch and pray. Wait on me. And as you wait together, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. When I send the Holy Spirit, you will have power. That power will then do a work in you that you could never do on your own. It will drive you out of that place, and you're going to take the gospel to Jerusalem. You're going to take it to Judea. You're going to take it to Samaria. You're going to take it to the ends of the earth. Testimony. These are the guys that turned the gospel or the world upside down with this gospel, right? They started by waiting and praying together at the command and the word of Jesus. I'm serious. Can we try it? This Wednesday night at 7 o'clock from 7 to 745, would you, and I say, oh, I have something. Guess what? Could you do it? If we do it next week, some, we're going to have something else. We do it the next week, we're going to have something else. We just have to pick. This Wednesday night at 7 o'clock for 45 minutes, could we get together, every single person here, and, you, and we're going to invite. You say, well, I have something. Okay. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt there's going to be important stuff, but at some point, the most important has got to get in the way of the important. I've already asked my kids, because they have games, I said, would, would you prayerfully consider skipping your games so we can all be there for prayer meeting? Because I believe, and if we, if we get a huge, a huge group, and we can come together, and if, if we all come together and we pray for those 45 minutes, and God doesn't do anything, you don't have to come back ever again. You don't have to come back ever again. You say, oh, you're really... No, I'm not doing anything. God said, right? If you come together, the Holy Spirit will be poured out. There's going to be power, right? This isn't anything that I'm, this is just what God said. He's called, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, seek my faith, and pray, I will, he, he's going to do a work. Can we come together? Can you get the word out? Can, can there be a buzz out there that God's going to do something? Can we stop wringing our hands and saying, oh, man, I wish something would change in my life. I wish something would change in my loved one's life with spiritually. The only way it's going to change is through the power of the living God. And if we keep doing the same thing, we're going to get the same results. Not that we're just coming together and wait together and say, God, okay, do what you said. There was a woman in China who met Jesus. This is, and it's, I say a little unlikely. Here, there's churches everywhere, but in China, things are different. She met Jesus. She began to spend time at home, oh, wait a second, praying alone. She would read her Bible and pray alone. But again, that prayer and that Bible study drove her out. She just, God's just impressed her. She's got to do something. She's being impressed. She's got to do something, okay? And, uh, but God, she, you ever wrestle with God? She's wrestling with God. She's like, but I, I can't sing. I, I can't preach. I can't, I can't, I can't. And God said, I, what can you do? The only thing that came to her mind all of a sudden is that she could make bread. She, she could cook. She could bake. Okay? She said, I can make bread. What do you? And then God was silent. So the next day, instead of making one loaf of bread, she made two loaves of bread. 
She went to her neighbor's house who she really hadn't met before. She knocked on the door. She introduced herself. They talked for a brief. I'm your neighbor, blah, blah, blah. And said, so I made you a loaf. Why would you do that? Oh, because I, I love making bread. I really enjoyed it. I thought you might enjoy it too. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, bye-bye. She left, went back home. The next week, she did the same thing. She made not one loaf, but she made two loaves of bread. One for herself, one for her neighbor. She has that loaf of bread, and she goes over there, knocks on the door, and she's like, oh, you're back. Oh, thank you for the bread. It was so wonderful. Yes, oh, you're welcome. Here's another. Oh, wow, why would you do this? Well, I just thought, can I pray for you, she said. In China, it's a little bit different because here we can pray and whatever. There, you're not allowed to pray in groups. The woman was hesitant for a second, but then she said yes, and she shared some specific requests. They prayed together. She went back home the next week. Again, a week later, two loaves went back. Loaf, can I come in? Yes, come in. They actually shared some of the bread, prayed again. This continued on week after week. Before long, the woman said, would you like to come to my house? We'll study the Bible together and pray. Oh, I'd love to do that. They came over, and they began to study the Bible. As they studied the Bible, again, as they prayed, uh, um, this was kind of her family. It drove them out. All of a sudden, so we can't just do that ourselves. We've got to share this with others. So the two of them started, instead of making two breads, they were making four breads. And so they had four loaves of bread, and they began to go to the neighbors. And the same routine, on and on and on. Would you like a bread? Can I pray for you? Before they knew it, they were inviting people to the house, and they were meeting in the living room. And they were packing out the living room. After they packed out the living room, they started to fill. They had to move from the living room into the garage, where they now had 80 people praying and studying God's Word. It got to the place where this garage was just too packed. It just wasn't going to work. And God impressed upon the lady, the original lady, to sell the house. But God, God was silent again, sell that house. So she put it up for sale. It sold very quickly. She had the money in hand. Where am I going to go? What am I going to do? God, what do I do? He said, go and look for the uh, house. The very first house you find, buy, but make sure it's the biggest one. She goes, she finds the house for sale. It happens to be gigantic. She goes, she meets with the individual who is selling it, and he tells her all the specs. It has this, you know, it's a quarter of an acre, but, it, you know, a bedroom, square footage, and roof, and blah, 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 taxes, all this kind of stuff. And he says, and the price is, and she said, oh, because the price was exactly four times more than she had received for her house. And she said, well, I only have this much. And he said, <laughs> what, what? Why are you wasting my time? Do you expect me to sell it for that? I have to be crazy. Lady, what are you doing to me? And she said, well, I'm trying to buy a house because I want to have a place to invite all the neighbors to come and study the Bible and pray. His demeanor changed instantly. He looked away as if he couldn't even look at her. By the time he looked back, his lip was quivering, and he said, lady, I'm sick. I don't have a lot of time, so I'm selling my stuff. And I told the God of heaven that if he wanted me to do anything for him before I died, that he should tell me. I think this is it. You can have the house. She moved into the house. The guy moved out. She had the house. And all of a sudden, that original group of 80 moved in, not moved in, but they would come over to the house, and they would study there. And then they would go out with bread, and they'd be praying. And it went on and on. Within two years, there was 250 people within that house praying and reading God's word illegally in China. Can I tell you that God is not only the God of China or Africa or South America. He is the God of North America, Tennessee, and he has a work for you and I to do. It's not we can just muster it up, who's with me, and we get all riled up. No, it comes with, Lord, would you humble my heart that I would push everything aside and understand my need. Give me that eye salve that I would understand my true condition apart from you, the condition of the world. It would drive us into groups where we would pray to receive power to take the gospel where it is intended to go. These are souls that Jesus has died for, and he has called you and me to be his hands and feet. All the head to the ecclesia, the called out ones, to reach the word, world with the everlasting gospel. Would you be here on Wednesday night with every single person you know in the world that we have to spread out across this place and pray for 45 minutes and just see what this God does? In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. 
to meet on that beautiful shore with you. The object for which you died, your family. Lord, we, we're going to get to meet Moses. We're going to get to meet uh, Mary Magdalene, King David, <laughs> Adam and Eve. We're going to hear the stories of what you did in their lives. Lord, we can't wait for that moment to spend eternity with you. Thank you for providing a path for us to be saved. And so, Lord, we give ourselves to you. We pray that you would do work in us and then work through us to do all that you want to do in this world. Lord, keep making transfers. Use us. Help us to be responsive in the moment to how you speak to us. And Lord, we continue to pray for a packed house Wednesday night as we just wait on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please be seated. So once again, thank you, everybody. Uh, the invitation Wednesday night, you say, well, I'm, I don't pray out loud. That's okay. You can be Joshua, and you can just listen. Your presence there uh, is of equal value uh, if you can make it on Wednesday night uh, here at 7. So thank you for being here tonight. Uh, thank you to all of our participants, leaders who shared tonight, our technicians and our food people. There's a full meal, as always, prepared in the fellowship halls. You're welcome to stay and eat to your heart's content. May the Lord bless you and have a happy Sabbath.